wanted to thank all of you for joining us here today, and particularly thank the Open Society Foundation for hosting us here in this lovely spot um, and for making this uh, very important event possible. Um, and I'd also like to thank you, the incredibly wonderful panelists that we have today who uh, are, are taking some time to, to spend with us at a very, very busy schedule. I am Caroline Fredrickson, since I'm not making <laughs> Um, and I'm the president of the American Constitution Society. I think many of you uh, are familiar with our organization, but just in case, uh, we were founded in 2001, and we are a national network of lawyers, law students, judges, and policymakers who believe that the law should be a force to improve the lives of all people. And ACS works for positive change by shaping debate on vitally important legal and constitutional issues such as the ones we will hear about today. Five years ago, as you all know, the Supreme Court decided in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission that the First Amendment prohibits the government from restricting independent political expenditures by corporations, associations, or labor leaders. Fearing the effect that unlimited money could have and seems to be having, uh, particularly on state judicial elections, we at ACS uh, sponsored a nonpartisan empirical study by one of our panelists today, Joanna Shepard, to explore the effect of campaign contributions on state judicial behavior. Two years ago, in Justice at Risk, Professor Shepard reported on the growing relationship between money and how state Supreme Court justices rule in business-related matters. Now, in ACS's follow-up report, Skewed Justice, Professor Shepard has made what may be an even more chilling discovery. Independent expenditures in state Supreme Court elections, particularly tough on crime ads, have made courts less likely to rule in favor of defendants in criminal appeals. While these attack ads are often funded by business interests that are much more concerned with how the judges will rule in civil cases that concern their bottom line, it's the criminally accused often the most marginalized members of our society who have become the collateral damage. We look forward to working with friends and allies in the criminal justice community to develop and implement solutions to this very troubling problem. We'd also like for our efforts to be part of a broader conversation on why fair courts are vitally important to a number of communities. If you care about justice for the criminally accused, or reproductive, or voting rights, or a clean environment, you need to care about fair and impartial state courts. We have flyers on the table outside that list resources on all these issues, and I hope you will take one and join this vitally important movement. So now what you're waiting for. Uh, our panel today will help us understand the current condition of criminal justice in the state courts and the danger of injecting more money in politics into a system that already suffers from alarming racial and economic inequities. So now I will introduce Nikichi Haifa, who is a senior policy analyst here at OSF. Nikichi is not better suited to lead this discussion. She's been working on criminal justice and civil rights issues for a number of years. Before joining OSF, Nikichi served as an adjunct professor at Howard University School of Law as a legislative counsel at the ACLU, as public policy counsel for the Women's Legal Defense Fund, and as a staff attorney for the National Prison Project. So now, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, well, I would like to thank Caroline Fredrickson, President of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, and Christopher Gerger, ACS Director of Policy Development and Programming for convening this very important uh, forum to educate the community on this uh, very critical issue and I'd like to thank you for joining us. Unquestionably, state uh, Supreme Courts play an important role in American government. Today we will look at how the proliferation of judicial campaign spending has changed the landscape of state courts with a specific focus on the new report by Dr. Joanna Shepard and Dr. Michael Kang, Skew Justice, Citizens United Television, Advertising, and State Court Justices, uh, Decisions in Criminal Cases. 
The empirical research in this report sponsored by the American Constitutional Society has helped to promote understanding regarding the role state courts play in our system of democracy and the effects elections and other judicial selection systems can have on the administration of justice. I'm very pleased to introduce this uh, prestigious and expert panel who will examine these issues. And their full bios are available in the handout, so I'll just provide a first brief um, overview of who they are. Um, we're going to hear first from Joanna a Shepherd, co-author of the report Skewed uh, Justice. Joanna is a professor of law at Emory Law School and also serves as adjunct professor in the Emory Department of Economics. Much of her research focuses on topics in law and economics. She is the author of two textbooks and numerous expert reports, and has testified about her work um, for the House Judiciary Committee, the National Academy of Sciences, and before several state legislative uh, committees. Uh, the Honorable James C. Nelson is a retired justice um, from the Montana Supreme Court. He received his JD from my alma mater, George Washington uh, University, and worked as a financial uh, analyst with the Securities and Exchange Commission before engaging in private practice in Montana. He served as Glacier County Attorney before his appointment to the Montana Supreme Court in 1994. Uh, Norman Beamer is the Executive Director of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers which is the preeminent organization in the United States advancing the mission of the uh, nation's criminal defense bar to ensure justice and due process for all and to advocate for rational and humane criminal justice policies. Norm has been a criminal defense lawyer throughout his illustrious uh, career. He is a recognized leader of the organized bar and a spokesperson on behalf of legal system reform. He has notable appellate achievements, including landmark decisions in search and seizure, law in his corpus, and international extradition. And we will also hear from uh, Tanya Clay House. I understand she's on her way. It's the director of public policy at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. In that capacity, she works on core issues including education, voting rights, employment discrimination, fair housing, affirmative action, criminal justice, um, immigration, and other racial diversity issues. She coordinates the committee's policy with state and local legislative bodies and has testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, the Senate Rules and Administration Committee, the House Committee on House Administration, and the Election Assistance Commission. She has an illustrious uh, background on the Hill in both the Senate and the House. So I'm going to ask uh, Joanna to uh, lead off our discussion with an overview of her pivotal uh, report, a few justice, hopefully you picked up a copy of it, and talk about the key findings uh, within, um, after which I'll call upon our, our panel to make remarks, and then we're going to open it up to hear from you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to take the opportunity to thank ACS for their continued support of my research um, and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm just going to speak for about 10 minutes, just going to lay out the general study and findings of the study uh, before we launch into a broader discussion about the implications. So this study focuses on the influence that money in judicial elections has on the criminal justice system. Specifically, we look at the relationship between the attack ads that are run in many uh, TV campaigns during these judicial elections, the unlimited spending unleashed by Citizens United, and the way that <coughs> judges are voting in certain kind of high-profile criminal cases. We focus on these issues in state courts um, for various reasons. State courts handle 90% of the judicial business in the United States, and they're even more important in, the, in criminal law. As you know, they handle over 95%, or about 95% of the felony convictions. Given the vital role that the courts, the state courts play in uh, um, these kinds of cases, it's very important to understand how judges are selected in these courts and the various factors that may influence them um, through the selection process. So this chart shows the different selection methods in the state. Um, all of the kind of red tinted uh, states uh, represent any sort of election system. So there's partisan elections, Nonpartisan elections, retention <coughs> elections, and then the gray state represents some sort of either gubernatorial or legislative appointment. And so this is just looking at the state supreme courts. There are a lot of states where there's different 
methods used for the highest court and then the lower courts as well. We were focusing on the state Supreme Courts. So this map has been relatively stable over the last several decades. There's been a couple of little changes here and there, but it's been more or less the same. What we've really seen changing in the last few decades is the amount of money in these elections. So just to give you an idea, um, you, you know, through, through the 70s, most of these elections were very sleepy. There was almost no, if any, money spent during them. They were often, often incumbents run, ran unopposed. Beginning in the late 80s to early 90s, we started seeing the influx of money. Most of the um, historical accounts of this uh, point to the tort reform movement. So this was during the time the tort reforms were being adopted by the legislatures, and so they needed to make sure the courts were going to uphold those tort reforms when they were challenged. So beginning in the 90s, we start to see a very dramatic increase. In the early 90s, uh, typically we saw about $6 million raised overall uh, by state Supreme Court judicial candidates in, a, in an election cycle, so that was the sum over all of, all of the judges. Now we regularly see over 45 million raised. So in about 15 years, we've seen an eight-fold increase. Even more important um, than this expansion and spending is um, the, sorry, there's different slides than I thought they were, um, it is the transformation in how this money has actually been raised. So we've seen a, a very dramatic shift from there being uh, money given directly to the campaigns of the, of the candidates to now being spent um, in going to, to independent groups and more independent spending. So this um, chart shows the percentage of the total money that is going to independent groups rather than directly to the campaign. Um, and so obviously this is where the Citizens United link comes in because Citizens United uh, said that these bans on independent giving by corporations and unions uh, were unconstitutional. So it really kind of unleashed unlimited independent spending. <coughs> Um, so to give you kind of a, this is a percentage, but to give you an idea of the magnitude of these changes, even in the early 2000s, we've seen quite a bit of direct money um, already going to the candidates, but there was still very little independent spending. Um, during the 2001 to 2002 cycle, there was about $2 million of independent spending in these judicial races, whereas in the most recent year, there was over $24 million. So that's you know, about 12 to 13 years, we've just seen this very big increase. In fact, most of the biggest spenders and the biggest contributors to judicial campaigns now give a lot more money to the independent groups than they do directly to the judges' campaigns. Um, so we're, we're looking at uh, being, you know, pretty soon the independent spending is going to certainly overtake the direct spending. It's about equal right now, and it's only increasing. So this money um, has really transformed the way these, these elections uh, are, are going, uh, primarily by providing significant funding for TV ads. Um, and so, whereas in the 90s, we, we barely had any TV ads that were run, um, what you can see now is, you know, in the most recent election cycle, we had over $33 million spent on these TV ads. Um, it's important to note that when these, ad, these ads are funded, some by political parties, some directly by the candidates, a lot by the independent groups, but it's important to note that when the ads are, are funded by the independent groups, they're more likely to be attack ads. And so the turquoise area here represents the percentage of the ads that are attack ads for candidates, independent groups, and the political parties. And this is a common story. We see this in, in different elections, not just judicial elections. In general, there's less accountability because there, there's less of a direct connection between these independent groups and the candidates, and so um, they can, you know, they're not, there's not the same concerns for running attack ads that they could be uh, perceived badly by the potential voters. Um, oftentimes these ads, uh, as was previously stated, even though they are, are financed by a lot of different groups, business groups and other um, single issue groups, they tend to focus on criminal justice issues. Because these are the issues that voters remember. And so part of the, this problem stems from the fact that voters, in general, are often ignorant about the candidates that are running, especially so in judicial elections. They just don't know the relevant issues. So when they go into the voting booth, they will remember if there was an attack ad that ran that said, judge so-and-so, let the pedophile out, and look what happened, he did it again, or something like that. Those are the things that stick in the minds of voters, not issues about breach of contract cases or court cases or anything like that. Um, so here's an example uh, of one that came recently. We were, were going to have videos, but we couldn't get the audio to work here. Um, I'll read it for you. Ralph Armstrong was a convicted rapist out on parole. 
Uh, when convicted of raping, beating, and strangling a 19-year-old co-ed to death, there was eyewitness testimony, fingerprints at the crime scene, and blood under Armstrong's fingernails. But Lewis Butler wrote the decision to overturn this rapist conviction. On cases taken up by the Supreme Court, Butler sides with criminals nearly 60% of the time. Tell Lewis Butler that victims, not criminals, deserve justice. So this is just one example. There's so many examples. They typically involve rape cases or you know, uh, sexual assault, uh, children, ped pedophilia cases, murder cases. Um, the hard, in general, the more kind of scandalous, the better, um, I think, from the perspective of a lot of these groups. Um, and this one particularly was funded by the Coalition for America's Families, which when you do your research is actually the Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce Association. Um, so, you know, it, it's really, this is not a hyperbolic example of some of these ads. Uh, they, there tends to be a lot like this. And um, if you actually will go to the website uh, that the study is at, there we have links to several of these attack ads. Obviously, there's no background um, information given, right? We don't know if there were constitutional issues, if there was evidence issues, procedural issues. We have no idea why Lewis Butler ruled the way he did. All we know is that you know this particular fact pattern um, has emerged. So um, these campaign ads in the last five years have ran in 23 states. Uh, we see an increasing trend, as I showed earlier, in the number of attack ads that are running. And the concern is that, and we've actually heard from judges who indicate that in some of these cases, they're thinking about, and sometimes apparently even casually joking on the side, about how this is going to become fodder for a future TV attack ad. Um, they often vote the way that they know they need to based on the procedural and constitutional issues that they realize that it could become a future fodder for an attack ad in their next election cycle. So to study this influence of independent spinning and TV ads, I worked with a, a team of independent researchers and we coded 3,100 cases and, and the kind of mo the, uh, more likely to be politically salient types of criminal cases. We looked at murder cases, robbery cases, um, violent aggravated assault, rape, sex crimes. So we were looking at particularly um, cases involving particularly heinous crimes. We coded these 3,100 cases in 32 states, and we had individual judges' votes from 470 state Supreme Court judges. We merged this data with data from the Vernon Center's Buying Time Project that collects data on the number of TV ads run during each election cycle um, over the past several years. And we also merged this with various uh, data on the judge's career, state specific specifics about the state judicial system, criminal justice system, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a, a very large data set, lots of different variables that we could use to control for, for the various factors that might influence the way judges vote. Our first finding, we found that the more of uh, these ads that are um, aired during the judicial elections, the less likely judges are to vote in favor of the criminal defendant in these cases. And so I won't go into a lot of the specifics, I bore you with the specifics of the empirical analysis, but basically this trend shows the decreasing likelihood of the judges to vote for the criminal defendant as more and more TV ads are run in these states. Um, it's important to know that the result was statistically significant, and we also found that the magnitude became stronger the more ads were aired, which means that as we see this trend, especially after Citizen, Citizens United of more and more TV ads running, we would expect this effect to become larger and larger. We also looked at the direct effect of the Citizens United ruling, which um, even though we've only had one full election cycle since then, the unlimited spending that was unleashed by the Citizens United uh, ruling made, obviously, immediately started funding a lot of these TV ads, but also increased the threat of future ads and, and more ads in the future. So what we were able to do here, the states in blue were states that actually had bans that, citizens, that the Citizens United ruling struck down. And so in the gray states, there was a smaller effect of Citizens United because they didn't have the bans that were then found unconstitutional. But what we did is look at how the judges' rulings in the blue states changed um, after Citizens United in comparison to the gray states where we wouldn't expect as much of a change. And we found that very quickly in the first year or two after, uh, we found votes in favor of criminal defendants to decrease by about 7% in the blue states. Um, and so, again, it's statistically significant, and we would expect as we see more and more elections and larger and larger number of TV ads, and especially the harsh attack ads that these groups often run, we would expect this effect to become larger and larger. 
So I will stop there and turn it over to um, the other panelists who are going to give additional um, information on how to talk about or answer any questions about this later. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really troubled. Um, uh, Justice Nelson. Thank you. Um, I think what's interesting about the study, uh, Joanna has looked at this problem from the outside looking in. Uh, I can tell you that I have lived this from the inside looking out for 20 years. And what the study uh, says and the findings of the study are absolutely correct. They're true. Uh, I think we all need to, to understand and appreciate what's really at risk here. And what's really at risk is the fair, independent, and impartial judicial system that most citizens in this country, and I think most lawyers in this country, simply take for granted. And if, if the dark money folks, if the super PACs, if the Koch brothers, the RSLC, and groups like them uh, get control of the judiciary, and that's what this is all about, getting control of the third branch of government. If they get control of that third branch by spending their way to the top, then we're going to lose that fair, impartial, and independent judiciary that we've all come to uh, expect and rely upon. Uh, <coughs> Certainly criminal defendants are going to suffer a measure. Uh, and if you think that, uh, that uh, when these groups try to spend a justice onto a court or off of a court, uh, and they use the uh, defendant's rights as the uh, fulcrum to do that, uh, they really don't give a damn about defendant's rights. They really don't care. What they want to do is to get somebody onto a court which marches in lockstep with their philosophy or get somebody off the court that does not march uh, in lockstep with their philosophy. Big business, big religion, big politics uh, view states and cities and courts as profit centers. And anything that they can do to ensure that their institutional aims, their profits will go forward. That's what they're going to do. And that's, that's what this is really all about. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that when uh, <coughs> justices running for political office are attacked uh, during their campaigns, uh, it forces them to look over their shoulder constantly. Uh, and I can tell you that from personal experience. Uh, you, you have to fight to make yourself vote the way the law requires you to vote, and most judges do, most judges do. But uh, it's in these marginal cases where there's a close call, and perhaps the race should go to the defendant. It doesn't go to the defendant. It goes to the prosecution. And when that happens very often, uh, the rights of criminal defendants are views, and uh, when the rights of criminal defendants are implicated uh, and abused, all of our rights are implicated and abused. Any one of us could wind up in court at any time. Uh, any one of our loved ones could wind up in court at any time. And if, we, uh, if, we, if we lose the fair, impartial, and independent courts that we rely on to uphold the Constitution and the rights of criminal defendants, we are going to suffer um, as I said, these attack ads force justices to look over their shoulders. When you uh, enter a decision, you think, uh, how is this going to play in Poughkeepsie uh, four years from now, two years from now, when I have to run for office? Uh, and as I said, most judges uh, swallow hard and do the right thing, but uh, in some cases, they don't, and in the marginal cases, especially. So, big money, dark money, uh, it not only influences judicial elections, but it influences judicial decision making as well. And uh, 
But there is simply nothing as effective in ratcheting up fear than to say, candidate X will turn child rapist loose on your block. Fear is effective, and modern communication medium bring that fear directly to the voters on their televisions, on their computers, on their handouts. There is very little disagreement among those of us on this panel, um, but if for no other reason than to expand the discussion, I want to make a few additional uh, key points. First, the problem may very well have been worsened by Citizens United. It may have put the whole problem on steroids, but it is nothing new. It is inherent in any judicial system and in fact exists in, in any judicial election system and in fact you can see evidence even when it's an appointed system where there is insufficient insulation from the political process. In 2006, uh, there was a note written in the NYU Law Review by Joanna Cohn Weiss called Tough on Crime, How Campaigns for State Judiciary Violate Criminal Defendants' Due Process Rights and it established a correlation between increased sentences and proximity to re-election re and between affirming death sentences and proximity to re-election. In 2002, uh, in the case of uh, the Republican Party of Minnesota against White, the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 de uh, decision, struck down a judicial canon which limited uh, judicial candidates from competing uh, for commenting on pending issues. Um, and in her concurring opinion, <coughs> I surmise based on her strong advocacy, uh, in this area, particularly since she's left the bench, Justice O'Connor wrote, elected judges cannot help being aware that if the public is not satisfied with the outcome of a particular case, it will hurt their re-election prospects. Even if judges were able to suppress their awareness of the potential electoral consequences of their decisions and refrain from acting on it, the public's confidence in the judiciary will be undermined simply by the possibility that judges will be able to do so. And as far back as 1995, as Steve Wright and Patrick Keenan uh, wrote a piece called Judges and the Politics of Death, deciding between the Bill of Rights and the next election in capital cases, and they showed how judges facing election were more likely to sentence a defendant to death and less likely to enforce constitutional fair trial rights. Um, the next point, uh, the studies that I just mentioned and everyday experience throughout the country uh, underscore that while skewed justice focuses on appellate decisions, the problem is far, far, far worse at the trial level. It is not just appellate judges. It may be harder to study because you have fewer written opinions, but it is self-evident in countless ways. Bail decisions. The use of bail schedules judges have publicly defended as giving them cover. Denials of motion to suppress. I personally have had many cases in which judges have told me in bench conferences, boy, that's a bad search, but see, I just can't suppress that evidence. I'm, I'm going to be in deep trouble when I have to stand for re-election. Um, and of course, in sentencing decisions. And yet judges uh, on the trial level are actually the most susceptible to pressure. Because for one thing, they're making decisions every day. They get much greater publicity and public scrutiny than you have of appellate cases. And they stand alone. They don't have the cover of a panel of judges. They are the decision maker. Uh, and they are certainly subject to attack by well-known and identifiable constituencies, um, uh, such as police unions and other law enforcement personnel that have an interest. But they are also subject to manipulation by other interests. And remember, oftentimes, this, these things that you see up here, that Butler case and some of these other cases, the Caperton v. Massey case in West Virginia, it's a, the fight is really about commercial interests. It's usually about the, the, the plaintiff's bar versus the corporate interests, the unions, the conservatives. It's about, it's about nothing to do with criminal justice. But because of the fear factor, that's where you go after somebody. The Butler case was a classic example. They were after him for his decisions. Uh, that's why you saw that, I forgot what the name was, but it was, it was clearly a, a tort reform group that was going after Butler. Um, my final point is, is, has to do with whether or not merit selection with retention elections is an answer. And my position on that is that it is not, and that there's increasing evidence of that. Um, there's a great report put out by the Brennan Center, Justice at Stake, and the National Institute on Money and State Politics called The New Politics of Judicial Elections 2011-2012. Um, 
and while noting that historically retention elections have been less polarizing uh, than contested elections, uh, that's not necessarily true, particularly since 2010. Uh, they particularly focus on situations in Iowa and, and Florida where tremendous amounts of money were, were flooded in there in a retention election. But I want to share with you in, in, in my closing uh, my personal favorite. Um, this is the retention election of Illinois Supreme Court Justice Thomas Kilbrock. Like the Caperton v. Massey case, uh, the criminal justice, this shows how the criminal justice system itself is the roadkill in struggles between commercial interests. The real issue in Kilbride, in, with Kilbride was his decision to remove a malpractice cap. So uh, I don't have a slide and I don't have a video, so I'm going to do a little, uh, a little acting here for you. So this is a menacing male voice. I was convicted of sexually assaulting three different children. A second menacing male voice. I was convicted of shooting my ex-girlfriend in the face and murdering her sister while our daughter watched. Third menacing male voice. I was convicted of sexually assaulting a woman and her ten-year-old daughter, <coughs> and then I slashed their throats and burned them. Defiant male voice. On appeal, Justice Thomas Kilbride sided with us over law enforcement and our victims. A disappointed male voice. Unfortunately for felons like us, other judges overruled Kilbride, and our conviction stood. Alarmed female voice. Thomas Kilbride sided with violent felons like these, and in dozens of other cases that you can find, at kilbridepertectsfelons.org. <laughs> Vote no on retention of Supreme Court Justice Thomas Kilbride. Uh, now, the saddest part of this, which I think shows just how low this can go, is this ad. An assertive male voice. Justice Tom Kilbride, a strong advocate for the victims of crime, endorsed by our police and prosecutors. Tom Kilbride wrote the opinion that protected victims of sex crimes from their attackers and, ruled, and rulings to simplify the prosecution of sexual predators and domestic violence abusers. We need judges who stand up for victims, not criminals, for fairness, for victims, for justice. Vote yes for Tom Kilbride. So, here's my point. To save his seat, Justice Kilbride, I guess, felt that he was forced uh, not to respond uh, with a defense of fundamental constitutional principles or, what, or an explanation of what the role of a judge was, but he resorted to a similar kind of attack. He did not explain that when a judge reverses an improperly obtained conviction, that is a triumph of the rule of law. It's not because that judge sides with felons. No, instead he succumbed to the politics of fear and pandered to the perverse notion that no truly good judge will ever uphold the rights of accused people. So where is all of this leading? What's the future of, of justice uh, when virtues such as fairness and impartiality are expendable traits? I think Judge Nelson made the point very clearly. The, the future of a fair and impartial judiciary is at stake. Um, it may very well be that we can't preserve it if we allow this to go on. And I will say this, even as Judge Kilbride amassed his own war chest uh, to respond to the attacks by extolling his own anti-crime credentials, he observed, and I quote, if we're going to allow the courts to be politicized to this degree, with there's more and more big time money coming in, it's going to ruin the court system and we might as well shut down the third branch. Uh, Kilbride survived with, by a margin of about 5% more than he needed. But whether or not our independent judiciary will survive, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're now joined by Tanya Clay House, who's uh, with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And uh, we introduced you earlier. We know you're just coming from the Loretta Lynch vote. Um, so welcome and share with us. Sure, great. Thank you. Um, what happened with folks? Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So she uh, passed cloture, um, 66 to 34. Uh, we're expecting their vote uh, on her confirmation around two. Uh, Cochran and uh, Ayotte 
and obviously the other vote in agriculture. So we're hoping that I think Cochran will be a vote for yes as well after we vote Martin in office. So there we go. Um, so to the issue at hand. <laughs> um, so again, thank you for the invitation to be here. And, and, um, so my role is to kind of talk about the barriers that were that are already being faced by those who are coming from the court system. And I'm going to discuss a few of the issues that I know that we uh, deal with as we're working particularly on issues um, within the criminal justice system as well as uh, working on the judiciary. Um, I, I, sorry, I missed a, most, pretty much everything that was said except for your <laughs> story. Uh, but I, I expect, I know that I've been on some other panels and we've also talked about retention election, and so I'm going to get into that as well because I think that that's an important topic to discuss as we're um, understanding um, some of the issues that particularly are confronting uh, communities of color and also those who are um, uh, particularly within um, uh, for uh, minority bar associations. Um, I think, as most know, there is a different perception uh, of the criminal justice system and of the judiciary uh, amongst communities of color. In particular, uh, for African Americans, I believe it's around 7 out of 10 um, blacks um, have a negative perception of the judiciary. Um, you have, obviously, a much lesser percent, I think, um, you know, within the 30, 30 34 percent of whites. Uh, have a negative perception of the judiciary. Um, I hope the vote's not occurring now. So, uh, uh, and as a result, that means that people are coming with different perceptions, negative connotations. Before you even get to the uh, judiciary, you're dealing with, uh, you know, how you even uh, end up in the court system. Right now, I think as most know that we're dealing with a lot of the, um, we're seeing a lot of more highlighting of what's happening uh, amongst uh, uh, people who are being pulled over by police right now. Um, and that is not new. And I think that what is actually happening is that there is a much more recognition uh, of the fact that there has been uh, an over-incarceration, there has been a bias that has been applied particularly against people of color, um, and not just African Americans, I'm talking about all people of color. And it is something that I know that we feel has to be addressed on a basic level, not only within the police system, um, police, so we need to deal with police reform, but we've got to deal with this whole culture of a bias. And so there's an implicit bias that exists. Um, there are a variety of studies, current institute, you know, by many, um, you know, Berkeley, you've got a number of, uh, of, of research that talks about the implicit bias that exists all the way um, beginning from the basis levels of when you're uh, initially arresting or um, actually viewing a person of color, particularly African American, um, and whether or not, and I'm then moving all the way up to the justice system, um, even all the way, you know, to the, to the judges. Um, there are simple things that could be done even to address that, but I think at some level, many people don't even realize the bias that exists when you walk in a courtroom. Um, and I think that, you know, if we're talking about barriers, uh, we definitely want, you know, we can't, we're, we're already dealing with the fact that um, the economic, uh, the unemployment rates among uh, African Americans continues to be in the double digits. You're dealing with an economy uh, for people of color that um, is much worse off and hasn't necessarily rebounded, um, unlike many feel uh, as, as, we're deal as we're moving forward after the Great Recession. And so therefore, within that whole context, as we're, uh, the whole view of essentially the system um, is, a, is, a, is a much, uh, uh, I think um, the perception is, is very skewed. Um, and so therefore, I think that we've got, we can't continue to talk about issues of how we're going to um, um, deal with you know, the additional money that's coming into the system. We actually don't even get down to the base level 
of fixing the way the structure is created and dealing with those that are within the system that already have that in which the buy in dealing with the bias that are, is already within the system. Um, there are a variety of different ways in which we can address this, um, in not only dealing in, in and I was talking you know, talking about some of the retention elections. That's not one that I feel is the best way. Um, and you know I think that uh, as we look at um, ways in which we can. Um, fix or, or deal with some of the barriers that, that are being confronted within the system, um, you know, we, there's already, beyond the implicit bias that exists, there's also um, a feeling about the merit selection process that there's an implicit bias within that system as well. And so if you've got the bias within the system in which the judges are being elected, particularly about a month's Minority Bar Association, and I can speak on behalf of the National Bar Association, in which there is a great feeling that their the merit selection process is um, biased not only against people of color or African Americans, but particularly against those who are in fields that are not traditionally um, um, considered qual you know, you know um, worthy of the judiciary. So if you're working for a small firm, you're not in a corporate structure. If you're working as a defense lawyer, which often many people of color are within the smaller firms, um, these are all that's, those are biased against those. And so the Bar Association or the National Bar Association it continues to address um, the structure in which we're working to put judges on the bench. And so if we're dealing with that structure, then we can't automatically assume that um, allowing a retention election is going to be the best way. Um, to create, to change, excuse me, the, to change uh, the way in which we're uh, a, a limit or to fix some of these barriers because if that structure is already broken, we're not going to have a fix. We're just fixing a broken system. Um, and so, you know, there, um, you know, I, I think that there is a, a lot to be said that I'm sure has already been said, so I'm not going to keep belaboring the issue, but I, I do think that. Um, you know, there, there, there has to be a, an appreciative, appreciation and understanding um, that the entire perception, I think, that is being viewed, uh, that those that have in communities of color of the entire judiciary system is much different um, from the moment we walk out the door. Um, you know, from the moment I walk out the door, it is, you're seeing an African-American woman. Um, it's not something that I can change as, as I walk in. I can't hide behind that. And so my entire perception of and those that are walk you know that you know African American men, women, Latinos, um, other people of color, there um, it's not a friendly perception per se. And so I think this is something that has to be acknowledged. It has to be understood. Um, and I think that we can't ignore that concept as you're trying to address the various barriers. So money, money in the elections, money in campaigns. Um, obviously, we have to address that because that is something that is going to continually skew and create these additional barriers for create, or create these, this context in which you have judges that are potentially going to be um, biased as a result of the, you know, the money that's coming into their election contest. Um, but that bias um, is just on top of the other bias that is already potentially uh, allowed as a result of how they were achieved or how they were. Um, came into the justice system and how the structure was set up and which judges were put on the bench. Uh, so, you know, I I think I have more to say, but I'm going to stop. I'm just going to rail for a while. I stuck on Lynch. But um, I do think, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, justice system, need to get an African-American woman in the attorney general position. So, I, you know, that's, that, there we go. Um, so, let's keep working on that. <laughs> Um, but I think we can deal with a lot of the bias, and I think, but I, I do think that underlying all of this, we've got to deal with the initial structure, which I think is the bias, the, the implicit bias, and not just explicit bias, but implicit bias that people don't actually appreciate and understand as a person walks into not only the courtroom, but also um, the entire perception from the origination of that arrest um, to their initial bond hearing. Um, to the prosecutorial uh, discretion that is given or not given uh, by the attorney, all the way up to the judge and the discretion that he is or she is giving, um, and whether or not they are going to have certain sentences, the maximum or minimum. So 
Um, thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you so very much. I really want to thank our panel for uh, shining a spotlight on these issues. And I think I just want to, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions and then open it up uh, to everyone else. I want to just play the devil's advocate for a moment, uh, if I can, and anyone can respond um, as they wish. But uh, if a judge uh, once elected assures the public that he or she will be fair and impartial, is there any real harm to the criminal defendant? <laughs> absolutely. It's absolutely the case. You can't unring a bell. So just think about a few of these, okay? Uh, campaigning for an Illinois Supreme Court, a candidate bragged that he had never written an opinion reversing a rape conviction. Uh, a candidate for an Indiana judgeship pledged to stop suspending sentences and stop putting criminals on probation. Uh, another one in running in Florida said, in, a, in her tough on crime campaign, I'm only going to believe police and victims. Uh, and a judge in Texas uh, says, I'm very tough on crime. I don't believe in leniency. I have no feelings for the criminal. Now, let's assume that these statements are all just <coughs> campaign hyperbole. If you're the individual standing before that judge, and that judge says, I'm not going to give you probation, or I'm going to give you a, a harsher sentence, uh, or I find you incredible, but I find that cop's preposterous story credible. Do you have confidence in the system? I mean, really, I have to agree with Tanya, and I sort of was alluding to that at the beginning. This is about how we as people feel about the most important nexus that we have to government, is the courts. That's where most people interact with what our system is about. And so I have to say strongly, I, I, I don't care what the, judge, the judge's protestations are, that I only said it in campaign, I didn't mean it. We can't have that. Those judges shouldn't be sitting in those cases. Well, I'm thinking, too, uh, and I, I'm, I'm frankly amazed that anybody can come after us. <laughs> but, but the typical campaign, I, people want to be in some office, I will be fair. I will be impartial. I will be just. And I guess if you can't believe this, I don't know why you should believe those statements either. <laughs> Do you think this statement is too bold? That we now in the post um, that we that we are now in the post um, Citizens United world as a result of conscious or unconscious pressure that we now have a system in which judges put their careers at risk every time they rule in favor of a criminal defendant or against rule against business interests or any other interest in which money has unduly um, influenced. Are we living in that system now? I think that's, you know, we're certainly seeing that risk. I mean, there are, there are states where, for whatever reason, there are specific elections that may not be that competitive. Um, and, a, and a judge, even if he's had some rulings that in a different election cycle at a different time period could be used against him, may not be just because of the nature of the specific election. But I think every judge is at risk. And, it's, and you know, I mean, obviously, the judges that um, may have be generally tougher on crime or less at risk than, than the others from these attack ads. But I think most judges, and we do believe that most of them are trying to do the right thing and trying to um, respect the Constitution and re respect the procedures that are supposed to be followed, it's really any judge that could be at risk, obviously some more than others, and the ones especially that are, are systematically ruling against business interests may be more at risk for this. I had one other um, nice little anecdote I wanted to say. We all know the Caperton v. Massey story, one of the first um, campaign finance and judicial election cases that went to the Supreme Court. Um, back when the whole story was unfolding and um, the Massey Coal Company started um, a, a group called And for the Sake of Kids. I always, I always love the disconnect between who's funding these groups and, and what their names are. But And for the Sake of Kids ran, which was funded almost exclusively by Massey Coal Company, ran um, a, a, an ad accusing the incumbent judge uh, that he released a child rapist that then agreed to let this convicted child rapist work as a janitor in a West Virginia school. So the, these, there's just, we could, we could stand up here for eight hours and, and give example after example of these. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say the answer to your question is, yeah, I think we are in that world. 
where if, if there's a gr if there's a group that for for whatever reason, usually the way, the way that you're voting in in a lot of these commercial cases is out to get you, so there's an ad they can run based on looking through your entire portfolio of cases you've ruled on in the past four or six years since your most recent election. I, I think that, that that's correct. <clears throat> what people need to understand, Citizens United was a sea change. And I think it was a sea change as has as been pointed out. There's always been bias and bad judges and good judges and, and the system has floundered along as it has. But Citizens United was a sea change because it, it enabled uh, so much money to come into the system, into these elections, that, that judicial elections now go to the highest bid. And that's, that's just the blunt way to put it. Uh, last election cycle, we had, uh, in my state, Montana, had two Supreme Court justices up for election, two incumbents. One is uh, fairly conservative justice, there's no problem, he's a good judge, but kid. Uh, the other fellow was more progressive. Uh, 1.6 million bucks was dumped into that race by super PACs. Uh, the candidates didn't raise a fraction of that kind of money on their own. 1.6 million. Now that's chump change when you compare the amounts of money that have gone into Iowa, and Illinois, and Alabama, and Tennessee, and North Carolina. Michigan, some of these other states. It's chunk change. So it, it was the most money ever spent in a judicial race uh, in Montana. Ever. Next election cycle, 43% of our seven justices are up for election. We've got one open seat. And I, I am just, I lay awake nights worried <coughs> about the tens of millions of dollars that have been dumped into that race to elect people to that court we're going to march lockstep with the people that supply the dark money. And when they do, in our state, in Montana, it's going to completely change the ideology of the Can I just add a little bit to say that it's also people who lock for them. Um, and the, for those states that do have, um, have elected judges, we already have a problem um, as we attempt to diversify the bench of uh, people of color getting into races because of the lack of funding, um, because they're not coming from the large law firms, um, and because it's a very expensive process. Um, the addition of this money that's coming outside the state um, for those candidates that, you know, for, a, you know, I suspect um, a large uh, amount are not going to be people of color. Um, that's challenging, and I, did, I can't. I don't have. I don't know what the statistics are out there about this, but I, I think that it's something we need to start looking at for. Um, I think it's important for us to understand not only um, the barriers that it's creating for all judges in terms of um, and the challenges and the biases that it's creating, but also the the, the barriers that it's creating for our attempts to. To, to diversify the bench, because uh, we can't all be, already we have a problem with that, and so I think it's um, I think we need to look beyond. Um, I, I think I just I think we need to look beyond um, just the uh, initial uh, the initial areas that we are going to see. Okay, well let's just say we took all of the money out of um, uh, out of the election or significantly limit it. Would it resolve concerns about judicial impartiality in the criminal justice? Context. Take all. Remove the money. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it clearly would. It clearly would help. But no. We, we have to be. I mean, we, if, we have to look at this problem a little bit more globally. Um, a, a lot of the points that have been made here uh, are are also true in an appointed system. It all depends upon whether the structures insulate or the degree to which the structure is insulated from the political process. When you have a situation like uh, I'm, com I'm familiar with in New York City where most of the local judges are appointed by the mayor, um, it's fine if your mayor has a good ideology. If your mayor hasn't got such a good ideology, it's pretty tough. Uh, and they know that they're going to be up for reappointment and these various forces are going to be at work. So there's no panacea here. There's no 
we're not going to we're not going to have a truly fair and impartial criminal justice system or judiciary um, without doing a lot of fixes. But yes, taking taking the big money out would would make a big deal. And I also believe that what we really need to do is have very very strong transparent uh, recusal rules so that when somebody has received money from a party or somebody connected with a party uh, and it reaches some modest level, they ought not to be hearing that case. Um, or if somebody makes the kinds of statements that we've talked about, they ought not to be sitting on those kinds of cases. Okay, I want to open it up to you. And I think there's a microphone <coughs> right now that you can just um, state your name and the organization you're representing. <coughs> My name is Joe Freeman. I practiced law and politics in New York for many decades. So my question is aimed at the gentleman from New York. Um, you said that the Supreme Court judges, which are in fact our county trial judges, are elected. But as you very well know, they are actually appointed by the county party leaders, which is why when you go vote in November, you see the same nominee from both the Republican and the Democratic parties. So we don't have these little problems that you were describing because we don't have real elections. Is this a better system? So you're, that's interesting that you bring that up. There was a case decided by the Supreme Court. You probably know about it a few years ago. I think it was Lopez Torres. With the Supreme Court, which county? Uh, the United States Supreme Court, oh, you are, oh, where Supreme the New York Court. system was challenged. Yeah. We, we're, you're right. It's, a, it's an elected system for, uh, for uh, the Supreme Court justices. Uh, which are the low court, the trial court in New York. Uh, and, you know, it was very controversial. I mean, uh, the, the objection to that is that it was completely controlled by the political bosses. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, because of the demographics, because of the politics of the situation, many, many minority groups were very supportive of that system because it did improve diversity. Mm -hmm. So these are very complicated issues. But does uh, it improve the decisions? When you get out, do you get the kinds of problems you were describing with a real electoral decision? Or do you get a truly independent judiciary because they're not dependent on money, they're dependent on the county boss? The, there's a, in, my, in my experience, when a, a judge is relatively secure in a system, and that's a system where you are, you are very secure, it's very difficult, you almost never see an incumbent knocked out mm -hmm. uh, under that process. It does, in my opinion, lead to greater independence in their decision making. It's really the question of, look, this is all wrapped up in how we, how we make judges in this country um, and how judges can survive after they've spent a period of time on the bench. They're worried about their livelihood. Let's be practical about it. They're not, they're not uh, capitulating because they're bad people or they don't want to do a good job. But we, we created a system in this country where, however you get there, if you can't stay there, you don't have much of an opportunity. It's not like when a federal judge leaves the bench, they get a big job at a big law firm. That's not the way it is. Yes. My name is Kami Bhatt, I'm with the Pakistan Strike Paper. And my question is to Congressman Nelson. Uh, do you think if county governments uh, try to just make a law uh, uh, about offending somebody's religion, uh, I'm talking about uh, the, the, the new ad in New York that says that uh, killing as many Jews as I could is good, could take me to the and this is my jihad and what is your jihad. So this is very offensive to some people. So would it be, uh, if some politicians suggest to ban these kind of acts, would they be uh, uh, opposing uh, First Amendment? And my question to this house is that, you know, the kind of prejudices that are in our system you just mentioned about. Uh, I didn't complete my law school. And my question to you is, how can we get rid of them? Because I do not know when we are going to have a black president again after Obama. Uh, if we couldn't get during his time, those, how can we do? And the example I want to give you, uh, I am a little bit involved with the uh, uh, litigation, and I signed DC Superior Court. I have to file a complaint against three judges who are considered liberal and Democrat. But somehow, when they deal with farmers, it's very difficult to control their prejudices. And today, I'm filing with the fourth judge who is not even boss, Peter uh, Demio. They just cannot control you know, the, the, the flaws that you just mentioned. Thanks. Okay, with that to well, let, yeah, let me let me take a shot at answering your question. Um, 
I was always educated to believe that, uh, that no constitutional right is absolute. Uh, I, I, Montana's constitution protects the right of human dignity. It's the one constitutional right I do think is absolute. I don't think that can be wrong. But certainly the First Amendment, at least until Citizens United, was not absolute. But I think because of Citizens United and the breadth of that decision, uh, when it comes to political free speech, I think the court has come about as close to decreeing an absolute right as it could come. So, as offensive as those types of statements are, uh, in the context of an election, I mean, this, this stuff here that was pointed out, uh, judges getting up and promising that I will never overturn a rape case, I'll never do this. You know, uh, that, that's offensive. Uh, but in terms, in the context of an election, I think you can probably get away with it anymore. And that, that's, that's a sad state of affairs. But, but uh, we can thank the U.S. Supreme Court for that. Okay, next question. Where? Uh, yeah. oh. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, she had, I think she only asked her. Yeah, and I just want to make sure that I understand. Your question was how do we fix the line? Right. Okay. Um, there's no one fix, but um, I think first we need to make sure that people get trained. And actually, um, there are trainings that are out there that, that can be, um, that all can go through. Um, um, from the judiciary on down to the prosecutors and the defense pro and, and the defense bar um, that can pull out um, some of those biases that we don't even realize exist. For example, um, you know I've had many that we talk about this amongst within the within the national bar where um, the attorneys walk into the courtroom and are mistaken many times by the judge as being the uh, defendant. The one who is, um, you know, and you, they're not in change. There's nothing that would give the impression. I mean, they are in a suit and tie, um, but it is an, an assumption. Um, and but there's no recognition uh, by that judge that that is inappropriate. And so then they have to continue with their case with this in mind and this understanding that this judge. Um, already has a, a, a belief that as a person of color, they automatically were assumed to have been a criminal. Um, so that's why I'm saying, so, so everybody can have those biases, um, so you need to be trained and need to recognize when those biases exist, even a bias as assuming that just because um, if you talk, you give different names uh, <clears throat> or give, there's a, there's, a, there's a test where we talk about how, um, uh, I can't remember how it goes, but, but the, 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 the moral of the story is that uh, when you give the answer to this particular scenario, um, you oftentimes realize that there, you had a bias in assuming that the doctor was actually a, a woman and not a male. And, 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 and so there's a gender bias that exists as well. So, so I think training is necessary. Um, I think that we, we do need to increase the pipeline. Uh, so obviously in the law schools, and that's what we're working with in the law schools, to increase the pipeline going into the judiciary. Um, and, and also change the intellectual process and, ch and change the process by which, um, in which the, whether or not you're talking about appointment processes or you're talking um, uh, um, both on the state and the federal level, um, but we also don't have the diversity of those that are within that uh, within uh, <clears throat> sometimes if you whatever process is being created to select the judges, there's no diversity within that context as well. So, uh, you know, those are a few suggestions. I think you know there are more, but we can talk after. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Greg Moore. I'm the executive director of the NACP National Voter Fund. Uh, and with the uh, Democracy Initiative. We had a form of justice at stake last, a couple weeks ago, and the idea of trying to find the best method for uh, moving money to judges. And the more I thought about it, and the more I hear about this topic, the more abhorrent it sounds that giving money to judges, if you think about it, say it three times, it starts to get more and more abhorrent. 
So my question is whether I took Judge Nelson and anybody on the panel, does the idea of a state notwithstanding Citizens United being able to develop a process for public financing of judicial elections, is that something that you think would help the system or something that would be able to be and withstand any challenge from Citizens United? Well, let me address that. Uh, uh, Mr. Moore, I haven't met you formally yet, but uh, Greg and I were just recently appointed to the board of directors of Free Speech for Me. It's good to meet you. It's hard to meet you, too. <laughs> uh, let me say something. We, we, we've talked a lot about electing judges and the merit systems and why none of them work. Uh, just to be a devil's advocate, very briefly, I've changed my mind because of Citizens United, but I like the system of elected judges before Citizens United came out, at least in our state of work. It produced good judges, the, the <coughs> campaigns were relatively low-key, there wasn't much money involved, and, and I think it worked out. Citizens United changed all that, so uh, I have now changed my mind that, that a true merit system is probably the way to go, without any money involved in it at all. I think judges should be, or candidates for uh, the judicial uh, appointment, uh, uh, judges for retention appointment, should be judged on, on their character, on their scholarship, and on their experience, those three things. I wrote an article uh, in our Montana Bar Magazine, and, uh, this last paper was published in February, where I suggested a merit system that I think would be a true merit system uh, that would, to the extent humanly possible, I think get politics out of the process of choosing, choosing uh, uh, judges. Uh, I think that can be done in my state it would require a massive constitutional amendment to do it, but I think it could be done. Uh, we've got to have people either elected or appointed. Uh, and I think the best way to do it is with a true merit selection process. I don't think the executive branch should be involved in any way. I don't think the legislative branch should be involved in any way. Uh, I, I have, again, suggested a system that I think would work that takes care of those problems. But uh, uh, I would support a merit system group without any involvement. Not public finance, just pure risk. Yeah, I just want to make one point about the public financing. Um, we have a, a couple of states who have that currently, and, and a few others have experimented with it, and then it's gone by the wayside. But um, the problem with the public financing is it limits the contributions um, directly to the candidates. But we're seeing more and more independent money, especially after Citizens United. It doesn't touch that at all. And so you I mean, you know, so maybe certain problems are solved and then other problems are created under this, um, but it certainly what doesn't eliminate the influence of money. It just redirects it. Hi, uh, Stephen Spitz of People Demanding Action. Uh, I'm thinking about what you're all saying, and I agree with Justice Nelson, you can't, uh, because of the First Amendment, censor the speech it's considered speech. But until Citizens United is overturned by a constitutional amendment or otherwise, could we structure something sort of similar to the fairness, the old fairness doctrine, where when somebody is attacked, particularly by name, that person is given free time on the airwaves to respond, or something of that sort. So there's some element of balance in this, particularly when you have unlimited funds that could spend millions of dollars attacking the person and the person doesn't have funds to respond otherwise. Well, that, that presupposes that the, that, the, that the subject of the attack ad, the judicial candidate, is going to somewhere come up with enough money to produce the same kind of and quantity of slick TV ads. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm postulating that the person gets free airtime when he's personally, he or she's personally Well, I don't, yeah, that's fine about the airtime. I don't know if you could force force the media to give anybody free airtime. I, I, I don't think that's going to work. 
But to produce a TV, it had to cost a hell of a lot of money. And uh, nobody's going to pay for that except the person who's, who needs to have that TV ad made. And I've, I've been, I had an election where we hadn't produced TV, and it's, it's astronomically expensive. Uh, and it takes time. So, plus, Stephen, the other problem is, a lot of these slick TV ads come out right before the election. And, uh, you know, you have this blast of TV five days before the election, there's nothing to do about it. Uh, you can't get TV time, uh, even if it was free. It's all taken up. So I, I, I just, I respect your suggestion. You know, the other questions? Questions or comments? Yes, sir. Okay, I want to just give one final question, if I can, and you can really kind of make concluding remarks as well. It's just a very general uh, uh, question, and basically is why should anyone um, hear about state courts and how judges who serve in them are selected in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> make a little concluding, whatever you want to say. Yes. Well, I, you know, I, said, I spoke earlier about the percentages that uh, over 90% of cases are handled by the state courts, but for the majority of Americans, these are the issues which affect their daily lives. I mean, obviously, the Supreme Court rules on very important things, the U.S. Supreme Court, the federal courts do a lot of you know, important business as well, but for kind of the day-to-day -day life of most people, and beyond just criminal cases, um, I know that's kind of you know, our main topic here, but I've, some of my work has been featured on a TV series about divorce cases, which somebody cares as much about, but um, you know, that, that, that in the big divorce cases, Oftentimes, the uh, one of the parties is contributing to the judge, and they're getting very different um, state, you know, differences in the state settlement. So this is it's it's, it's a huge problem, and, and the state courts, the courts especially, obviously those are the courts where the judges are being reelected, and they're more sensitive to all of these pressures than, than any of the federal courts. But they are handling the business, which affects most Americans most of the time. Yeah, I, I hope I hope we don't get the attitude that courts aren't important. Should suggest that they're the third branch of government, and if we if we uh, marginalize and trivialize uh, one branch of the tripartite system, uh, it's like cutting one of the legs off a stool. It's going to fall over, and we, we just can't do that. And, uh, courts affect the daily lives of people. Somebody gets injured in an automobile accident. The insurance company isn't going to pay. Where are they going to go for relief? Criminal defendant is charged, whether justly or unjustly. He or she is entitled to expect fairness and impartiality when he goes to court. He expects a fair trial. Uh, expects good counsel, and he's entitled to, uh, to uh, expect a fair appeal. And if if we if we lose those ideals. If we lose those notions of justice in this country, as I say, we've cut uh, one leg off a three-legged three stool, and the system is going to go uh, Why is it important? Uh, from the standpoint of, of criminal justice, I have, uh, I have a reason, actually. I have 14 million reasons. That's how many people, according to the latest FBI statistics, are arrested every year in this country. So 14 million people are passing into our criminal courts every year. It's important. So I'll add to that to say that we have one out of four black men that are expected to go to the criminal justice system today. Um, so it's extremely important, I think, that for all the reasons that we all just heard, it is what is affecting our daily lives. Um, in terms of recent events, um, it's important because uh, as we see what happened in Ferguson, as we see what's been happening happened in New York, as we see what's about to happen in Baltimore, as we see what's been happening in Ohio, um, you know, these are all going through the state court system. But for the fact that we have a Department of Justice that may be bringing investigations, that this is this is being handled on the state level, um, and we have state judges who are making these determinations. Uh, and they're, they're selecting the 
if there's a grand jury, if there's not a grand jury, um, they're selecting, um, they're making the, those everyday decisions. Um, and so people need to care. And if, particularly if they're being elected, as we just had an election in Ferguson, in St. Louis, we had to remind people, there's a reason why certain things are happening. You need to go to the ballot box and vote and make sure that you have people in office, your city um, manager, your mayor, the persons that are actually selecting those that are going or they're going to be on, um, you know, be these judges, or those that are going to be your, um, your, 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 your prosecutor. Um, that's why it's important. So I, every day we are talking about <laughs> the court system, and that this is, you know, for the most part, this is what people are experiencing every day, and this is how it is that they're going to, their lives are affected. And I think, particularly for communities of color, we've got to stress that fact. Um, and I think they, re you know, they realize it every day. Well, they realize it, but they realize it even more once one of the family members is members in the And Joanna is the author, co-author of Cube Justice, you have a Sure. Um, I just wanted to make one other point. I think the people in this room are generally very aware of the importance of independent and impartial judges. Um, I think they're also very aware of the consequences if we don't have impartial and, in, and independent judges in, in the criminal justice system. Um, but oftentimes when I present my research out among perhaps less aware or less sensitive audiences, people often pose the question, well, this is what happens when we have governors running and legislators running. Like, what, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with elections? Elections are supposed to allow, you know, people to vote and then select these people. And, and this is just, even if there's money that's influencing things and judges are bending their rule to, to please the constituencies, this is not what they're supposed to do. We want to make judges accountable to the constituencies. And, and I always try to remind um, the groups, and obviously it's harder in some than others, that the judges are not meant to be politicians. They're meant to be a check against these other political branches, where we know that there's those influences, and as concerning as they are in those other, in those other um, branches of the government, we at least used to think that the judiciary was there to kind of protect from the, the greatest evils of that. Um, and now, uh, you know, there, there's just so much mounting evidence in the criminal justice system and, and beyond that judges are the, the entire judiciary is being politicized almost as much as those other branches as well. And I just think that's so concerning, not only in, in this application, but even more broadly as well. I'd like you all to join me in thanking our <laughs>